Few corners of cinema are as synonymous with twists and turns as much as the horror genre. These shocking swerves have often elevated the picture from average to good or from good to great. But on the other side of that coin, sometimes these revelations can leave audiences baffled and bewildered by what they've seen. Having already covered 10 such frustrating twists, we're now back to showcase some more. So with that in mind, I'm Andrew from What Culture Horror and here are 10 more horror movie twists that pissed every one off. Number 10. The twist that ruined two movies. Brahms, The Boy 2. Arriving in 2016, the first boy movie was a surprisingly decent, genuinely unnerving picture that was a lot more than the spooky doll feature many presumed. With Lauren Cohen's Greta serving as a nanny to a porcelain doll, that'd be Brahms, the boy's spooky goings on across a lavish mansion are revealed to be the real life Brahms who, said to have died years prior, actually lives in the property's walls. Yes, he's a real person, not just a creepy spooky doll. That in itself was a fun twist, but Brahms, the boy, Two, that took a giant dump on all of that. For the boy too, it's Katie Holmes' Lisa and her son Jude who are tormented by the shenanigans of Brahms. And while this sequel just about limps along, the ending reveals that the Brahms doll is really a demonic entity in search of a human host, which totally goes against what had been established in the first movie. Number 9. It was all for nothing. Would you rather? Offering up a big payday to those prepared to do certain questionable things, Would You Rather has a properly soul-crushing twist waiting at its conclusion. At the center of this is Iris, a young woman roped into this sinister game on the hope of receiving financial support for her brother Raleigh's leukemia treatment, and to help him finding a bone marrow donor for him. With all other competitors dead, this game comes down to Iris and Lucas, a fella who'd previously saved Iris and who'd had to slice his own eyeball in a horrible, grim scene. Iris has a choice. She can either save both of them and leave with nothing, or kill Lucas and win the game, with her eventually taking that latter option. Traumatized, Iris is at least handed a bag of money and informed that a bone marrow donor has already been found for Rally. Though when she returns home with this good news, she tragically finds her brother has taken his own life after not wanting to be viewed as a burden. It's properly heartbreaking stuff and properly makes Iris's actions all totally for nothing. Number 8. The Non-Ending Ending – The Devil Inside One of the worst things a movie can do is leave its audience feeling insulted. Case in point, 2012's The Devil Inside. A found footage documentary style investigation into possession, our main characters here are Isabella Rossi, her mother Maria, filmmaker Michael, and priests Ben and David. Maria has been locked up in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years after killing three people during an exorcism. And Isabella, she's now making a documentary on the wider topic of exorcism and her mother's decline. By The Devil Inside's final moments, a possessed David has committed suicide, Isabella, Michael, and Ben are in a car, with the possessed Isabella causing Michael to be possessed, there's a lot of possession stuff here, which results in a car crash that kills Michael and Ben, but sees Isabella disappear. The twist here? Why, that's that the film abruptly ends, and directs you to a website for the full details on how things really played out. But even worse, that website, it just nowadays does not exist. So if you're watching this film for the first time this year, yep, you're not going to get your conclusion. Nice one. Number 7. Nemesis Turns Babyface Resident Evil Apocalypse Many a Resident Evil fan had a wry smile when beloved Resi 3 villain Nemesis was name dropped at the end of the first Resident Evil movie. By the time of Resident Evil Apocalypse in 2004, poor Matt Addison had been turned into the film's take on this all-powerful rogue and he caused plentiful chaos. And our lead hero Alice, she only realizes this midway through fighting Nemesis during the picture's final act. This silver screen spin on Nemesis, it certainly split opinion amongst longtime fans of the video game franchise, but the real kicker was the shocking, to borrow a phrase from the wrestling world, babyface turn of Nemesis during the final moments, as the creature turns an umbrella and saves Alice from a falling helicopter. What a guy. Number 6. The Water Swerve. Signs. Following on the heels of the stunning Sixth Sense and the fantastic Unbreakable, M. Night Shyamalan's Signs was pretty darn good. Well, until its often mocked final act, that is, of course. Focusing on the Hess family as an alien invasion swarms a planet, what do these creatures want? And how can they possibly be stopped from tormenting mankind? It's water. Yep, all it took was a bit of H2O. After doing such a great job of building up palpable dread throughout this film, these aliens, they just up and leave Earth. 
with a battle between Wacky Phoenix's Meryl Hess and the one left behind alien, revealing that water is fatal to these travelers from the stars. Of course, that begs the question of why these super smart alien beings would decide to pay a visit to a planet where 70% of it is made up of water. Yeah, the more you think about it, the less it makes any sort of sense. Number five, Tetra is UG, Critters 4. Critters 4 is by no means a great movie, but it is also a movie that very much turned off a chunk of those who'd stuck with this series up until that point. How did it do that? Well, by revealing that one of the franchise's greatest heroes was in fact now a corrupt villain, which is a never, never a great idea. That character, that's Ugg, an alien bounty hunter who'd helped to overcome the Krites in the first two films and then had a cameo at the end of Critters 3. Here, picking up directly from that end of Critters 3, Charlie, the town drunk turned Krite hunter of course, is reminded he can't kill the final two remaining Crytex, but wiping out a species is against intergalactic law. From there, Charlie is frozen in time and awakens on a spaceship in the year 2045, which is the really, really far off future, which creepily is not that far away these days. But there, the nefarious Counselor Tetra is desperate to get his hands on these remaining Crites. And when Charlie and his new future pals eventually come face to face with Tetra, it's revealed that this rogue is a turn to the dark side Ugh, Not cool man so 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 not cool number four the cult of thorn garbage halloween the curse of michael myers of the 13 Halloween movies so far, Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers is one of the absolute worst entries in the entire franchise. I love the Halloween franchise, but seriously, Curse of Michael Myers, mm, yeah, not great. And famously, part of the reason why so many horror hounds have such disdain for this sixth Halloween film, it's down to the shocking twist that explains why Michael is, well, Michael. Not every menacing figure in horror history needs a reason or rhyme for what they do. Sometimes, evil is just evil. Still, The Curse and Michael Myers paid no attention to that school of thought as we got the twist revelation that the shape is under an ancient druid curse known as Thorn which compels him to kill members of his bloodline on Halloween. It was dumb, it was daft, it made a mockery of the Michael Myers character and it made a mockery of the Halloween franchise period just absolutely sucked. Then again, the curse of Michael Myers had already irked its audience during its opening minutes, killing off Halloween 4 and 5 survivor Jamie Lloyd and insinuating that Jamie's newborn son was fathered by Michael Myers. Of course, making this extra icky is the fact that Jamie at this point was Michael's 15 year old niece. Just grim. Number three, it was all a simulation, Ghosts of War. Ghost of War, it starts off so promising, and it brings with it the rather unique setting of World War II France, where a group of US soldiers have to protect a mansion from Nazis. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, this lush chateau is, of course, haunted. The film sets its stall out rather well, bringing some great scares and plenty of atmospheric dread. Then, Ghosts of War goes properly left field when one of the soldiers, which would be Brenton Thwaites' Chris, he wakes up after an attack where he finds himself in a well-lit room and surrounded by doctors. Here we get the twist that what we've seen play out so far has all been a simulation and that our soldiers are actually modern day military men who've been stationed in Afghanistan. In order to assist with PTSD, it was decided to place these soldiers in a simulation. A simulation that's ended up haunted due to a curse placed by a family who'd assisted them in Afghanistan but who'd ultimately lost their lives. Desperate to return to the simulation to help his fellow soldiers and use his knowledge to help remove this curse, the next twist sees the fancy computer erase Chris's memories just as he's sent back into the simulation, where he's destined to live this experience out on the loop like a rather grim Groundhog Day. Number two, it's not Jason. Friday the 13th, a new beginning. Despite genuine plans to bring the franchise to a close with Friday the 13th, the final chapter in 1984, the strong reception to that movie saw Paramount Pictures return just one year later with Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. Here, we pick things up several years after the final chapter with Tommy Jarvis, of course he's the boy who brutally butchered Jason Voorhees at the end of that fourth Friday the 13th movie, taking residence at a halfway house near Crystal Lake. Before you know it, this house of young adults find themselves stalked and terrorized by a 
familiar hockey mask adorned killer. With the main question being, is Jason really somehow back from the dead, or is this murderous saw actually the quite troubled Tommy Jarvis? In a shock twist though, it's revealed that the person behind the mask is Roy Burns, a paramedic whose son Joey was slaughtered in the film's opening moments. Pushed over the edge, Roy opted to slice and dice his way through the teens of the day in ways inspired by the previous acts of Jason Voorhees. To say audience were pissed at this twist would be an understatement, with many feeling angrily duped at having paid to see Jason back in action, only to be given a Jason copycat. Not great. And even to this day, certain horror fans forever have a grudge against the new beginning solely because of its Roy Burns twist. Number 1. Kirsty Cotton's Bungled Return – Hellraiser Hellseeker for a horror franchise, one way to forever get your fan base excited is to bring back a fan favourite character. Think how big of a deal it was when Halloween brought Jamie Lee Curtis back for H20 in 1998, or even how much buzz there was surrounding Jamie Lee returning for David Gordon Green's eh, opinion split in Halloween trilogy. Heck, even bringing Heather Langenkamp back to the Elm Street series to play herself, that was one of the many reasons why Wes Craven's new nightmare is so revered amongst horror fans. So, where when Hellraiser brought Ashley Lawrence's Kirsty Cotton, as in the lead protagonist of the first two Hellraiser films, back for its sixth instalment, which that was 2002's Hellraiser Hellseeker of course, hope was high that the troubled franchise was set for an upturn. Sadly, Hellseeker immediately soured those fans with the twist of Kirsty being killed off in its opening moments, dying in a car crash also involving her abusive husband Trevor. To kick a fan base while they're down though, Hellseeker concluded with the revelation that Trevor, not Kirsty, had been dead through the bulk of the picture due to Kirsty having made a deal with Pinhead where Kirsty essentially saw to the death of five people, which would be Trevor, his best friend, and three of Trevor's mistresses. I mean, Trevor was not a nice man, but this is a point where, yes, our hero lived long enough to see herself become the villain, or at least make a deal with one. 